It's time for the mystery guest. Uh, he is the editor-in-chief of this fine magazine, George. <laughs> the nation's largest political magazine. Uh, he and the editors of George have a new book out, uh, just came out today, The Book of Political Lists. Very funny, very interesting. Please welcome John F. Kennedy, Jr. for coming. I... <laughs> we, we tried to keep it a mystery here, so... You did a very good job. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. you. No. <laughs> thank you for coming out. I, I know you don't usually do these kind of shows, so it's a thrill to have you here. Now, I know you're a New Yorker. Jerry's moving to New York. Any uh, tips? Tips. Tips. <laughs> <laughs> There's this great soup place. I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't know. Yeah, in the 50s. <laughs> really? Yeah. How is the service? <laughs> Uh, he's, he's, he's a ill-tempered I see. All right, I'll check it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let me ask you. I'm, I got to tell you, I, I, you you've, uh, my judgment in following Mr. Seinfeld on the biggest night in TV, uh, they always tell you in politics, you got to watch who you follow. So I don't know what I was thinking, but it's a great honor to be here. <laughs> well, it's an honor to have this you. night. Yeah. Let me, now, you were, weren't you on, no, you weren't on Seinfeld, but you were portrayed, right? <laughs> My elbow, I think. It was yeah, me, you, <laughs> yeah, we had, the, the, you were in the famous contest yeah. episode. Yeah, well, that's you, right. That's the very, <laughs> I did. <laughs> well, no, it, 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 was, it was funny because I, 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 I hadn't seen the episode, and I come out of my house in the morning, and... Everyone is like yelling across the street and I'm walking to work. You know, I was a district attorney then and people are driving by in their cars and honking. I'm going, what, what, what the hell is going on here? So I walk in and, you know, every, as people start to say, oh, you know, right. I saw you last night. Were you on Seinfeld? Were you on Seinfeld? I said, no, no. What, what is everyone talking about? So they explained it. And then I, I had a trial and I walk, I walk into the court and the defendant is sitting there over there and he goes, you were on Seinfeld. <laughs> And I was like, no, no, I wasn't on Seinfeld. And he, he leans over to his lawyer and he goes, guy's an actor, too. No wonder he failed a bar exam. Oh, wow. Wow. So, could we go back a second? Did you say you hadn't seen? <laughs> the only one. I was the only one. <laughs> But I got a tape, actually. The okay. office is very kind to <laughs> send it on. Now, you've been, uh, obviously, around politics your whole life. Do you think you will ever run? Would you ever run? Is that something? People always... Well, you know, other than a people asking me, were you on Jerry Seinfeld? Yeah. So that is the <laughs> second most frequently asked question. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm being an editor of a political magazine, you're, you're, you're able to be uh, in politics without really being in politics. Right, you know? right. So it's like... Like being the vice president, I guess. For yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Same. Uh, Ooh, but it's. Uh, is it? <laughs> no, I, I mean I'm, I'm, I have a great time doing that, and we all know that politics is a tough profession these days. But um, I think a very rewarding one. Well, the magazine is terrific. I know. Uh, I, I look through it because it gives me great ideas for jokes. It's, really? It's, well, I, I like it because it's. Oh no, no, it is because. It, I mean, sometimes you read political magazines. It's all sort of. Very dry, right. whereas you guys always come at it from a yeah. funny angle, which right. kind of sparks. Right. And you always do interesting covers. You always have uh, people playing. Yeah. Like you had, who was Dennis Rodman? What political figure was he? Uh, no, no, Charles Barkley. Oh, Barkley, he, that's what it yeah, was. Yeah, he was George Washington. George Washington. <laughs> and uh, Harrison Ford was uh, Abraham Lincoln. Right, right, right. And uh, Howard Stern was George Washington. Well, there you go. Which, there was a remarkable similarity there. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, we were, we've always actually been, you know, trying for, to get you on the cover to do. You think so? Yeah. Who would I? Yeah, uh, well, actually, I think we... We have, uh, we happen to have one Is right this, here. oh, I will, uh, I'd love to do it. Who do you, who yeah, would I? I put? think it's very. Oh, that's lovely. Lovely. Has anyone seen this? It's, uh, I see, that's. <laughs> lovely. <laughs> and, I'm a, and I'm a handsome woman, very busty, apparently. I'm a, very, a very busty woman. <laughs> well, now we're busting people for pictures. Let me ask you something, because I know I, in your life, I always see you, you always seem very dignified and avoid this and avoid that. And one day I opened George, and there is a picture of you, naked, in your own magazine. Wait, show, wait we have the picture. Show, there you are right there. Oh, now, you're naked. Now, 
How do you know he's naked? I can't tell if he's naked. Yeah, exactly. exactly. He looks like he's wearing shorts. Exactly. And running, and running shoes. No, no. The he man... could have a very small tuxedo on. <laughs> All right. Now, you might not be wearing pants. Exactly. Under there. No one knows that. Now, were you naked in the photo? Uh, I wasn't actually. I was. Oh. I had. I was wearing pants and 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 shoes. Mm -hmm. You would have perhaps had Newt Gingrich uh, nude from the shoulders down. I don't think anybody wants yeah, to see think that. So? Yeah. No, it wasn't. It was. You know, everyone always says that no one reads editors' letters, um, and they read that one. So, <laughs> what are you going to say? <laughs> it, it worked for the time being, but. Now, what is the Monica Lewinsky poem that is in here? Explain this. Oh, oh. Do we have to? I guess we should. Well, we should. What, we, we, um, we happen to have someone who sent us um, Monica Lewinsky's poem that she wrote in ninth grade. Actually, not, not in ninth grade, when she was a nine-year-old. And I, I know I'm going to rot in hell eternally for this, but, but I, can I maybe just give Read it a the, sample? Yeah, give a sample. Okay. Um, it was written... Uh, the, the poem is a poignant rumination on how, quote, I can be a delicious lunch, dinner, or breakfast, if you're weird. She goes on to describe herself, quote, as a round and flat piece of dough with lots of topping. I am a mouth's best friend. I make you say, yum, yum. <laughs> it's amazing how kids know at a young age what they're going to do with their life. <laughs> Well, this here is the, uh... Now, this was fascinating, because this is a you great like sort of reference book, uh, you know, yeah. just looking up odd things. It's, it's a book of celebrity lists. What is your... Uh, no, political, political I'm sorry, political list. Political, I mean, celebrity... Oh, it's, it's almost the same. Yeah, yeah. What is your favorite? What is your favorite? Well, there's a lot of them. I mean, you know, we tried to basically do... Uh, have a kind of a resource book about politics that also had uh, some funny things in there, and, and so that, you know, the whole problem with politics is people often think that it's dull and boring and, right. and they don't really appreciate some of the drama or some of the history or some of the funny parts. So um, there are uh, everything from uh, code names of presidents to Jimmy Carter's uh, ten, list of ten favorite desserts that he insisted to uh, <laughs> Richard what? Nixon's protocol at state dinners. What was the women, what was it, the women that ran oh, for the president? Women who ran for president who couldn't vote for themselves. There was, um, you know, we, there's, there's obviously lists of men who ran for president who shouldn't be able to vote for themselves, but the women, um, one of them, there were two, one of them was named Victoria Woodhull. She ran in, uh, for president in 1872. She's not, no one really knows about this, but she, uh, she was a free love candidate, and she had two husbands, and she got 3,000 votes, and uh, she, she, one of her suitors was Cornelius Vanderbilt, and before she ran for president, she used to get stock tips from him, and she opened up her own brokerage house in New York and made a killing. So she was really a woman, a very modern woman way before her time. Well, that's what's fun. It makes you realize there's nothing new, really, yes, under the sun. Well, I mean, everything that's been done has sort of been done. Yeah. But it's very funny, just odd facts about various political yeah. figures. Oh. Well, listen, it's, uh, of course, the Book of Political Lists, and, of course, George the Magazine. Thanks so much Thank for coming. So much. Really a pleasure to meet you. Kennedy Jr. I do I want to thank our guests, Daryl Hammond. Thank you very much, Sunday Night Live. Thank you very funny man. Story Spelling Trick is the movie. It opens Friday. And of course, Luscious Jackson. Electric Honey is the CD. I want to thank you for bearing with us tonight. I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to do jokes when, uh, you know, terrible things happen in the news. And uh, I think we've all were affected. And I was trying to understand why so much, you know. I mean, for me, growing up in Massachusetts and the Kennedys are so much a part of my life as a kid. You know, I remember my mom crying when John and Caroline were in the funeral, you know, and it, it sticks in your mind. And then when he came here and sat in the chair, it struck me that at what point did I think that my life would ever intersect with his life, you know? And he really made an impression on everybody here. Genuinely a nice man. I mean, all the Kennedy jokes we've done over the years, he, he could have been nicer and kinder, signed autographs, said hello. And then my wife and I were talking about it last night, you know, and you realize there, there are people that you just want to see grow old, just, just for the fun of it, because their life is so close to your life. 
You know, people like him and, and Princess Di, and you realize these people never really did any bad. Whenever you saw them, you smiled and you felt happy for them, and you wanted them to have a good life, you know? And for those of you who think somebody has something more than you, you go, oh boy, and then something tragic like this happens. So, uh, thanks for making the job easier tonight. I, it, it, like I said, doing the monologue, I said, how do you go out and do a monologue? But that's the job we have to do here, and try and be silly and try and maybe cheer people up. But please don't think it's, it's not on our minds, because if it's on your minds, it's on our minds too. So, I just want to say, uh, you know, say a prayer. And God bless him, and he was a very, very nice man. That's all. Good night, everybody. There's more bad news for President Biden, who is getting low ratings on pretty much every key issue ahead of 2024. A new AP poll reveals that 66% of Americans disapprove of the president's handling of the economy, 67% disapprove of his performance on gun policy, and the same percentage hmm. disapprove of his handling of immigration. Meanwhile, Biden continues to face questions about his age and fitness to serve even from those within his own party, Hillary Clinton now among them. Now there was that heart stopping moment where he almost fell over coming down the stairs a day or two ago. Is that a concern? Well, I mean, it's a concern for anyone. Um, and we've had presidents who've fallen before who were a lot younger um, and people didn't go into, you know, heart palpitations. Um, but he, his age is an issue and people have every right to consider it. That sets from the 60s. Um, so Congresswoman, <laughs> you know, she's, she's right, and that was a neutrally objective statement, frankly, that absolutely all Americans should consider it. They should consider everything when weighing in on a presidential campaign. Uh, perhaps this issue, however, will be more heavy than most. Uh, I, I think it certainly is top of mind, given there's constant reminders of what a concern uh, it is. But when you look at all of these different issues, Democrats are not happy with, with the work that President Biden is doing. So it should be a red flag to everyone watching to see how hard the DNC is trying to make sure that he is not held to account for his record. Uh, Simone Sanders was on Morning Joe the other day saying there will be no primary debate. There will be no stage for Bobby Kennedy or anyone else because the DNC will not allow it. It is all about Joe Biden. And I think it just huh. reveals their hand. They are deathly afraid of Bobby Kennedy. They will do all that they can to pretend like he doesn't exist. And if, and if he continues to build momentum, they're going to do everything they can to try to destroy his candidacy because they don't want voters to have an actual choice. They don't want to have a conversation where our president, uh, his record will be examined and, and criticized. Do you think that strategy would work? I don't know if it'll work? work, but I'll tell you, uh, he's incredibly vulnerable. Uh, I mean, this is day, we just reached day 853 of the Biden presidency. According to the 538 average, at this point in, in the presidency, he is the least popular president in the history of polling, with the exception of Jimmy Carter, which is kind of appropriate because he's the worst president since Jimmy Carter. Um, he's going to be, he's 80 years old. He's going to, he would be 86 if he won a second term. According to the Social Security Administration, and, and women live longer, but an average American man has a 60% chance of reaching the age of 85. So that means oh. about a 40% percent chance that Kamala Harris uh, would be president in a, in some point in a second Biden term. So she's on the ballot and she's that's even a, less popular right. than he is. And when you bring up popularity, Kaylee, these polls reflect an absolutely dismal point of view of not only the president's uh, fitness to serve, but also how he has performed or underperformed during his tenure. They do. But, you know, I have a little bit of deja vu because I'm sitting here listening to this and I'm thinking we could have had this same conversation November of last year before the midterms yeah. and look at what happened. Mm -hmm. The bad poll numbers for Biden didn't equal success for the GOP. So between mm -hmm. now and next November, I am going to be a siren for the <laughs> GOP having discipline here because even when you dig into this poll, you see the 30% approval on the economy, on immigration, gun policy even. So it's a dire assessment. However, when you dig down into this poll, there was this one aspect that caught my eye and it was on the debt ceiling. And it showed 79% of Americans say, we shouldn't raise the debt ceiling or if we do, we need to have deficit cuts. So I'm like, okay, Kevin McCarthy's winning on this. 79% of Americans mm. agree. But when you look at who they're blaming for this, they're blaming Kevin McCarthy, Republicans, Democrats.
Democrats and Joe Biden, meaning the GOP messaging is not breaking through. We have to be disciplined. We have to be smart. We have to be almost perfect because you're up against a liberal media. You're up against social media. So it's incumbent upon the GOP. Be disciplined and get rid of the noise. You know, you made me think of something, Tulsi. And, and when you're talking about how the left doesn't want Biden to take accountability or responsibility for everything that has failed on his watch, um, maybe that's where some of the ageism speak is coming from. Hmm. I mean, I remember when Hillary Clinton was running, and, and Obama, for that matter, with the Reverend Wright tapes. And it was always a little strange that late in that primary year, between Obama and Hillary Clinton, how those tapes suddenly appeared. And I thought, well, the left would probably have more access to this stuff than a Republican sitting in the pews of Reverend Wright's church. And I, I just look at this. Who politically actually benefits if Joe Biden is suddenly silenced by, I don't want to take an acuity test. And you've seen all of those, not just Robert F. Kennedy Jr., but others coming out of the woodworks now. Maybe Manchin would take a peek. Now, Manchin's only a couple of years younger than Biden, so I, I, it may be suggested that he would need the test, too. <laughs> but you were saying something during the commercial that really jogged my brain. Age is a problem in general in our leadership. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. When you look at the focus on a lot of the issues, or the lack of focus, actually, on real issues that are affecting families and working people all across this country, you've got a lot of folks who are in office who, who are and have been way out of touch with that reality uh, themselves for a very long time. Worse yet, and taking age out of it, because, you know, I'm not saying that our government has to be made up of only young people and young families and parents and working people. Right. It's just about caring. It's about saying, hey, I may not know what you're going through, so you know, I'm going to come and visit your community. I'm going to listen, and I'm going to better understand how we, in, in positions of public service, can actually work together across party lines to address those needs. And that's what we were talking about, is the lack of care and the lack of actual intent to solve problems. Right. You know what? Yeah. Some of that is driven by, Emily. Younger people don't have inevitability. They haven't been around for 50 years like Joe Biden. Who basically becomes king. It's inevitable. Mm. Everything's inevitable. You don't have that when you're younger. What's not inevitable, however, are those results. So to your point, Kaylee, we just need that discipline on the GOP side, and we'll get there if we stick together. Hey, everyone. I'm Emily Campagno. Catch me and my co-hosts Harris Faulkner and Kaylee McEnany on Outnumbered every weekday at 12 p.m. Eastern, or set your DVR. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page for daily highlights. First of all, it's great to see you again, Mr. President, and uh, good to have you here for the uh, summit. And uh, we are going to discuss many important issues at the summit. Among them is defense spending. And we all agree that we have to do more. I agree with you that we have to uh, make sure that allies are investing more. The good news is that uh, allies have started to invest more in uh, defense. Uh, after years of cutting defense budgets, they have started to uh, add billions to the defense budgets. And uh, last year was the biggest increase uh, in defense spending across Europe and Canada in a generation. Why was that last year? It's also because of your leadership, because of your uh, clear message. And, uh, and, uh, they won't write that. But no, won't. I have said it before, and, and the, but the thing is that uh, uh, it really has... Uh, uh, it's, it, your message is having an impact, uh, and uh, we are going to build on that to make sure that we have further increases. Uh, you initiated last year that uh, all allies are going to develop national plans on how to spend more on defense. And based on these nas national plans, we now estimate that uh, European allies and Canada will add 266 uh, uh, extra US dollars uh, for defense from now until billion. 20 uh, billion US dollars until uh, until 2024. So, so this is really adding some extra money. It helps, uh, and we are moving in the right direction. But we still, uh, but, oh, but we still have to uh, to do more, and that is what we're going to address at the summit later on today. Let me also add that that strong NATO is good for Europe, but it's also good for the United States. Uh, the U.S. military presence in Europe helps uh, to protect Europe, but it also helps the United States project uh, uh, power to the Middle East, to Africa, and uh, I think also that the cloud, the military cloud of, uh, uh, of Europe, uh, the economic cloud, the political cloud, also is helpful dealing with, uh, with Russia, and we look forward to 
the meeting you're going to have with President Putin, uh, and I think that leaders are also looking forward to uh, your thoughts about the meeting with President Putin at, uh, later on. Uh. Well, I have to say, I think uh, it's very sad when Germany makes a massive oil and gas deal with Russia, where you're supposed to be guarding against Russia, and Germany goes out and pays billions and billions of dollars a year to Russia. So we're protecting Germany, we're protecting France, we're protecting all of these countries. And then numerous of the countries go out and make a pipeline deal with Russia, where they're paying billions of dollars into the coffers of Russia. So we're supposed to protect you against Russia, but they're paying billions of dollars to Russia. And I think that's very inappropriate. And the former chancellor of Germany is the head of the pipeline company that's supplying the gas. Uh, ultimately, Germany will have almost 70 percent of their country controlled by Russia with natural gas. So you tell me, is that appropriate? I mean, we, I've been complaining about this from the time I got in. It should have never been allowed to have happened. But Germany is totally controlled by Russia because they were getting from 60 to 70 percent of their energy from Russia and a new pipeline. And you tell me if that's appropriate, because I think it's not. And I think it's a very bad thing for NATO, and I don't think it should have happened. And I think we have to talk to Germany about it. On top of that, Germany is just paying a little bit over 1 percent, whereas the United States, in actual numbers, is paying 4.2 percent of a much larger GDP. So I think that's inappropriate also. You know, we're protecting Germany, we're protecting France, we're protecting everybody. And yet, we're paying a lot of money to protect. Now, this has been going on for decades. This has been brought up by other presidents, but other presidents never did anything about it because I don't think they understood it or they just didn't want to get involved. But I have to bring it up because I think it's very unfair to our country. It's very unfair to our taxpayer. And I think that these countries have to step it up, not over a 10-year period. They have to step it up immediately. Germany is a rich country. They talk about they're going to increase it a tiny bit by 2030. Well, they could increase it immediately tomorrow and have no problem. I don't think it's fair to the United States. So we're going to have to do something because we're not going to put up with it. We can't put up with it. And it's inappropriate. So we have to talk about the billions and billions of dollars that's being paid to the country that we're supposed to be protecting you against. You know, everybody's, everybody's talking about it all over the world. They'll say, well, wait a minute, we're supposed to be protecting you from Russia, but why are you paying billions of dollars to Russia for energy? Why are countries in NATO, namely Germany, having a large percentage of their energy needs paid, you know, to Russia and, and taken care of by Russia? Now, if you look at it, Germany is a captive of Russia because they supply. They got rid of their coal plants. They got rid of their nuclear. They're getting so much of the oil and gas from Russia. I think it's something that NATO has to look at. I think it's very inappropriate. You and I agree that it's inappropriate. I don't know what you can do about it now, but it certainly doesn't seem to make sense that uh, they pay billions of dollars to Russia, and now we have to defend them against Russia. You know, NATO is an alliance of 29 nations, and uh, there are sometimes differences and uh, different views and also some disagreements, and uh, gas, uh, uh, pipeline from Russia to Germany is one issue where allies uh, disagree. But the strength of NATO is that despite these differences, we have always been able to unite around our core task uh, to protect and defend each other because we understand that we are stronger together than uh, apart. Uh, I think that two world wars and the Cold War thought was that uh, we are stronger together than apart. Um, but how uh, can you be together when a country is getting its energy from the person you want protection against or from the group that you want protection against. Because you understand that uh, when we stand together, also when uh, dealing with Russia, we are stronger. I think what we have seen is that... No, you're just making Russia richer. Well, you're not the, dealing with Russia, you're making Russia richer. Well, so I think that even during the Cold War, uh, NATO allies were trading with uh, Russia. Then there have been uh, disagreements about what kind of uh, trade arrangements we should, uh, we should go I into. I think trade is wonderful. I think energy is a whole different story. I think energy is a much different story than normal trade. And you have a country like Poland that won't accept the gas. You take a look at some of the countries, they won't accept it because they don't want to be captive to Russia. Mm -hmm. But Germany, as far as I'm concerned, is captive to Russia because it's getting so much of its energy from Russia. Mm. So we're supposed to protect Germany 
but they're getting their energy from Russia. Explain that. And it can't be explained. You know that. All right. Thank you, Press. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Press. Thank you, Press. Thank you. Thank you, Press. Thank you. 2014. It's been hugely improved. It's now rated as the number one golf course in the whole of Britain, Ireland and the rest of Europe. And it is a truly extraordinary place. I've been very, very happy to be staying here. It's the most beautiful hotel, possibly now the best hotel, certainly one of the best hotels in Scotland. Donald Trump, it's the first time he's been here in five years. I asked him how much he'd missed it. And I think the answer is hugely going into politics and current affairs comes at a cost. But he sat down with us this afternoon exclusively with me for GB News. And as ever, of course, Trump doesn't disappoint. I asked him what he thought about King Charles and the coronation on Saturday. I think it's going to be a great day, and I think that they will do a great job. Yeah. And he loves the country. And really, I got to know him quite well. And he loves the country, really loves the country. And he loved his mother. I also asked him about the ongoing war in Ukraine. What could he do if he was president of the USA? So if I were president and I say this, I will end that war in one day. It'll take 24 hours. I asked him, why was Joe Biden not coming to the coronation? And what did he think Biden would be doing? And when you have somebody that's going to be sleeping instead of coming to the coronation as president of the United States, I think that's... I think it's a bad thing. So here it is, Farage, the Trump interview, exclusively here on GB News. Hello. Hello. Hello, How was the golf? The golf was great. (laughs) It's great. (laughs) It's fantastic. Everything about it's beautiful. Great to have you here. Good. Lovely people. Oh boy! Did you see the wedding? I know. How beautiful. I know. I know. I was chatting with them last night. Yeah, very nice people. Ready? Ready. Let's do it. Thank you for sitting down with me and GB News. We really, really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. It's been uh, a long friendship we've had and respect for each other, and I appreciate it. That's no, well, nice. we're delighted. What a place. This is unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, you said when you arrived, this was your mother's home country, as indeed right. it was. That's and right. I know she spoke Gaelic. And, and it's funny because we had Joe Biden the other week telling us how Irish he was. But there's a yeah. lot of Scott in Donald Trump, isn't there? Well, my mother loved this country. And she would come back every year during the summer, with, usually with one of my sisters. And she just loved Scotland. And she respected the Queen greatly. Loved and respected the Queen. And uh, so we've had a tremendous relationship to Scotland. But when you come here, I mean, this golf course... Yeah. You've turned this golf course around. It's now the number one course in the whole of Britain and Europe. Yeah. You've got this magnificent hotel. You must have missed this place. You haven't been for a couple of years. Well, I've been years so now. busy politically that I haven't. It's been a few years, and we spent a tremendous amount of money. It was uh, done with uh, a great architect, great golf architect, recommended by Peter Dawson yeah. of the Royal and H. R. I said, uh, give me the best one, and Martin Hortry, and he's a... He's a fabulous guy, a fabulous man, and he did uh, what he does is this type of course, mm. and he, he really did a great job. And, you know, we had a lot to do with it. Also, we have very strong ideas. I have very powerful ideas on golf and what it should be. Well, I hear that yesterday you were out thinking how the course could be improved even further. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to make a couple of little minor adjustments, but it's, it's fantastic. Everybody wants to see the Open Championship here. The players, it's their favorite course. It's the number one rated in Europe. In some lists, it's the number one rated anywhere in the world. And they want to have the Open Championship back here. Uh, I would have thought that uh, Sturgeon would have wanted that and and pressed well. it but she she's got she's got her own agenda she's gone she's gone she's gone are you pleased to see the back of her well i i th- must tell you we we had a uh i didn't know her i don't know if i ever met her i'm not sure that i ever met her i dealt with alex salmon i got along great with him actually until the windmill started coming all over scotland they said you're hurting scotland you're destroying your environment frankly uh the windmills are uh, I think a great disturbance to this country and to a lot of other countries, very expensive energy. But uh, I, I had a very good relationship with him early on. Mm. When I was getting my approvals, I got all the approvals for Aberdeen, which is incredible. And we built an f- incredible place in Aberdeen also. 
and spent a lot of time on Turnberry, and Turnberry has been a tremendous success, as you probably know. No, I can see that. Well, she's gone, and uh, I have to say that she, she wanted to make Scotland the most progressive country in the yeah, world. Yeah. And we had this extraordinary case, this Isla Bryson case, a double rapist who decides that suddenly, you know, she's going to be a woman and get sent to a woman's prison. And Scotland just says, we've had enough of this. So it does kind of show the pendulum can swing back, can't it? Well, I think a lot of countries have had enough of it, what's going on. And I know that case, and I thought it was terrible. And I guess it, it helped ruin her career. I think she had other reasons also. But I just felt she didn't love Scotland. I mean, she, she would not treat, somebody comes in, spends a lot of money. Remember Sean Connery said, let him build his bloody golf course. <laughs> And after that, I got my approval, so it was incredible. Sean Connery, who's great, you know, yeah. great guy, tough well, guy. Well, the new guy, I do wonder, because uh, Humza Yosef, the new first minister, was asked about your trip. He said, I don't think he'll be rushing to meet me. I would find it difficult, I have to say, to meet him without raising the significance of concerns I have and the remarks he's made in the past. What he's referring to is Sadiq Khan. He says that your comments about Sadiq are anti-Muslim. Yeah, well, not anti-Muslim. I have friends that are Muslim and great friends and, frankly, uh, leaders of countries that are Muslim. And I've had great relationships. If you look at Saudi Arabia and many other countries, great relationships. Uh, so I don't exactly know what he's talking about. But, you know, I've kept a very safe country. When I was president, we kept a very, very safe country and did a really great job. But I don't know him. I hope he's going to do a great job. And I'm sure he's going to be a lot better than Sturgeon. Well, let's hope so. Now, let's hope so. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Now, it's, yeah, because actually people, I'm meeting in this hotel, meeting Scottish people, men and women in business, and they're all kind of saying the same thing, that Scotland's become a very uncompetitive place to do business. Well, they just said, I just walked by and there was a big crowd for a wedding, a beautiful wedding, incredible people, and they were not happy with the, uh, with the people that were running Scotland, let's put it that way. They said, run for, run for first minister, sir, run for first minister. <laughs> well, I think, you may have, I think you may have other things on your agenda yeah, on that score. But, you know, uh, <laughs> I just hope the new man is going to do a much better job than she did. She was very, very anti-money coming in, very anti-jobs, if you look at it. And I don't know her. I mean, I literally don't know her. But no. somebody that invests a lot of money in Scotland, you, would, you should cherish those people. Because I created tremendous jobs. Turnberry is a tremendous success now. We employ, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people. And this whole area is based around Turnberry. And it's been just, you know, it's been a joy to do it. It's a piece of art. It's greatest, I mean, again, probably the greatest course anywhere in the world. And we made it, uh, we, we kept it, and we really improved. You know, you have to upgrade and everything else and we did it to the nth degree and it's been an honor to do it but uh, we should have support from the government not always have to fight the guy it was always a fight with her mm. well let's let's, I mean, let's see where scotland goes yeah. but it's 16 years ago today that the snp first won a majority yeah. in the scottish parliament yeah. i just wonder with sturgeon gone with the opinion polls changing does it look to you like Scotland's now going to stay part of the United Kingdom? I think they should. Yeah. I think they should. I think they should all work together. And, you know, there's a great love of the Queen. It's very interesting. The Queen kept it together. This woman was amazing. I got to know her very well over the last couple of years that I was president. And we had events together. We had the beautiful, one of the most beautiful events that I've ever attended. And I sat with her for hours. And also, your new queen is going to be terrific. She has a fantastic personality, and Charles is a wonderful guy. I got to know him very well. No, no, it's, it's a very big week for them. It really is. It's a big week, and it's going to be yeah. a great week, and he'll be doing a fantastic job. I believe that. The last time we spoke on GB News, it was, in fact, the 8th of September. It was the day that the Queen died, and mm -hmm. you know, I could right. see you were very clearly moved by meeting this woman, and, and as you say, your mother was a huge fan she was. of the Queen. Now, coronation, this Saturday, it's our first one for almost exactly 70 years, so yeah. it's, a, it's a huge event. We've got over 100 heads of state from around the world are going right. to be in Westminster Abbey. If you were still in the White House, would you have gone to the coronation? Well, I would. I think it's a very important event. I think it's a great thing. A lot of people talk about the monarchy. Should you have it? Should you not? I think it's a fantastic thing. It holds your country together largely. And I think he's going to be a fantastic representative as king. 
and Queen, uh, she'll, she'll do a great job. She's got a wonderful personality. I got to know her very well also, sitting at dinners for long periods of time. <laughs> and I got to know her very well. And uh, it's going to be, I think they'll do a great job together. Now, Mr. Biden's not coming. What does that say about his relationship with the UK? Because we get the feeling here. Yeah, he's very, very pro Ireland. He completely ignores the fact that Biden is, in fact, an English name. He's got English relatives. He doesn't seem to like us very much. I don't think he can do it physically, actually. I think that it's hard for him to do it physically. I think getting over here for him, he's got a lot of things going and a lot of strange things happen. But certainly he should be here as our representative of our country. Uh, I was surprised when I heard that he wasn't coming. You would think he would be here. He'll be in Delaware where he spends a lot of time. He spent a lot of time there during the election. In the so, bunker. So I don't know. But it's, I was very surprised to see. I think it's very disrespectful for him not to be. Yeah, he's sending the first lady, but he's not going to be here. But somebody else who's not coming, of course, is Meghan. Meghan is not coming. Harry's coming. We understand it's a complete in out, like within two hours after the service, he'll be gone. But I kind of think, I kind of think maybe we're better off without Meghan coming. Well, I think that uh, she has been very disrespectful to the Queen, frankly, even during that time. I mean, how can you be disrespectful to the Queen? The Queen was incredible for years, for decades and decades. She never made a mistake. Think of it. With all of the people that you watch them and you see they make lots of mistakes. If they're famous people or not famous mm. people. But I don't know. I can never think of a mistake no. that she made. She was never controversial. When I was with her, I tell the story. They said, who was your favorite president? Oh, they were all great. They were all great. I said, who? But did you like Ronald Reagan the best? Oh, I liked them all very much. What about Richard Nixon? Oh, I thought he was wonderful. Then I said, who was your favorite prime minister? And she said, uh, just fabulous people, every one of them. But wasn't it Winston Churchill? Oh, I liked him very much. And I'm saying to myself, you know, this is so smart because there's like yeah. no controversy. Yeah. She went through years and years and decades without controversy and just did a great job. You cannot be disrespectful to her. And I think Megan was very disrespectful to her. Very, very disrespectful. Oh, I think, you know, up until her death, I think she was the most popular human being in the world. Yeah. I think the respect she commanded. I, I would say that that is true. Throughout the Commonwealth, America, elsewhere. Yeah. She was amazing. But it's a very tough act to follow someone like that for Charles. And he has his own views, his own way of doing it's things. True. He's going to modernize the service a little bit. And, you know, that's the man that he is. And we know the causes that he believes in. But it is a huge challenge both for him and Camilla. And I just would like you to say your message. I to think they're going to do it. I think they're going to do yeah. a great job. I got to know him very well. He does love the environment, I will tell you. He's oh, yeah. an environmentalist at the, to the nth degree, and that's okay. He likes windmills. He does. Like, well, so we can have a little disagree. <laughs> it's not that I'm against. I think they're extremely inefficient. I think they really hurt the environment. You know, when you look at them going all over the oceans and all over the, the plains, meaning the beautiful plains and vistas and everything else. And then you see these things. And, you know, when you look at them in 10 years and they're all rotted out and rusted and then you have to buy new ones and the new ones never come. And then they shut them off and they're sitting there rotting. And look. I'm not a fan, and it's very expensive, the most expensive form of energy. And they don't even, they don't even make it if you don't subsidize them. You don't have to subsidize no. energy. So, but we're uh, saving the planet. We're not saving the planet with windmills. You're hurt, if anything, you're hurting the planet, <laughs> and you're certainly killing the birds. Well, I, have you I'm, ever looked under a windmill? Have you ever gone to, you want to see a cemetery for birds? Just walk under a windmill someday. It's, uh, it's the most incredible thing. They have the greatest press going. Whoever does their public relations has done a great job. And these environments, they talk about wind, but it's really very dirty. And, you know, when you make these things, which are all made in China, almost all of them, when you look at the fumes, if you're a believer in this going up, you can never make up for the cost of that. And then, as you know, you're not allowed to bury the blades because they're made of a certain uh, hydrocarbon that's so dirty that if you bury them, it's going to destroy yeah, the no, earth, I, according I, to these people. I promise you. So you they don't know what to do with them. You haven't got to convince me. I'm, I'm not a fan of them either. No, it's a but it's a and you know, we have a phenomena in our country. I don't know if you do, but the whales are now all of a sudden washing up. I've sure. read some of that. Yeah. I mean, many, many times, like times 15 times 15 whales are coming up we never had this before 
and the wind farms seem to be driving them onshore. So I don't know what that's all about, but that's certainly not well, good. Thus far, none at Turnbury. Well, we don't have them at Turnbury. You've got a bit of Aberdeen. We take care of our, <laughs> but there's, care of our but whales. there's none here. Well, let's hope, let's hope that for Charles and Camilla, it's a really big day, and, it, and it's a very, very important day. And I, I think you're right. I think, I think the monarchy will survive in this country, but it, it'll have to change. I think it's going to be a great day, and I think that they will do a great job. Yeah. And he loves the country. And really, I got to know him quite well, and he loves the country, really loves the country, and he loved his mother. And that's why I thought it was she was yeah. treated so disrespectfully by Meghan, and just no reason to do that. I was actually surprised that Harry was invited, to be honest. I think at the end of the day, even after a fallout, it's still his son, isn't it? Well, I don't know. Look, I mean, different types of people. But I think it was very nice that they invited him. But I was a little surprised. He said some terrible things when, when you see what he said. And the book was just horrible. Yeah. To me, it was horrible. Yeah, it was. No, no, it really, really was. Now, the other thing that's changed since you were last here, and a lot's changed, doesn't it? We've got a new monarch. We've got yeah. a new first minister in Scotland. Boris Johnson, you had great hope, I think, for your relationship with Boris Johnson as prime minister. Oh. How do you think it all ended? I liked him so much, I still like him, but he really went a little bit on the liberal side. I mean, he all of a sudden became a, an environmentalist, and I'm, I'm talking about probably in a negative way, too much. Look, we all want to protect the environment. Nobody does more than I do. I do a lot of jobs. Look at this. This was done environmentally so incredible. Turnbury, Aberdeen. But something happened. He changed. And a wonderful guy. He's a friend of mine. Mm. I don't know whether or not he'll be able to make a comeback. It'll be interesting to see. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. I know you had your own um, events with him. Yeah. You, you had an interesting relationship yeah. with him. I mean, I watched that relationship. Yeah. You, you sort of got along and... I helped him a lot. Eventually, you got a little bit tired of it. Yeah. Just I know. I helped him enormously. In, I helped him did? enormously. And I, yeah. I kind of was a bit disappointed. I felt that kind of the Brexit deal wasn't really the right deal was the way that I looked at it. I think, you know, and I think much of your administration had reservations about that deal. But we've got Rishi Sunak now. Well, when I looked at what you were paying, I thought, said, why are they paying so much? It was a lot of money. Yeah. Now, I'm not involved in the deal. You know, you do what you have to do. But you were paying tremendously for that deal. And, you know, I had another way of doing it. I told you the way to um, do it. This was your advice to Theresa May, wasn't it? I gave her advice. I said, uh, didn't work out. They misrepresented. Do what you have to do. But, and I don't want to go exactly into it, but no. I, would have, I would have recommended paying very little or nothing. Mm. Because, you know, there was things that were represented that turned out not to be so. But she didn't listen to that advice, and look what happened. I think that, um, I think Boris is a very good person, but I think he changed a lot in office. A yeah, lot. well, I think a lot of people finished up very disappointed. He's still got his supporters, obviously, and people like him. Rishi Sunak is bringing a level of stability, I think, to the job, whether you agree with the policies or not. He's bringing yeah. some stability. I don't know him, but he seems to be, you know, working very hard and doing a good job. But Labour are in the lead. Sir Keir Starmer's Labour are in the lead. Um, I guess after 13 years of the Conservatives, people start to think maybe a change. I don't no know. No reason to think that. I mean, uh, if you stayed Conservative, but they really weren't staying Conservative. They were going, I mean, they were literally going far left. <coughs> it never made sense. Now, I'm saying this as an outsider, but an outsider looking in, they were going far left. What were they doing? And now maybe Labour's in the lead. Maybe they're not. I don't know who's in the lead, but I can tell you they were not Conservative policies toward the end. Well, they look very similar in many ways, but Sir Keir Starmer's getting hung up on this question of what is a woman. You know, when he's asked this question in interviews, he mumbles and stumbles and struggles to give an answer. So the question he struggles with, and everyone in the Western world seems to struggle with now, and we've got, you know, again, another transgender athlete, this time a cyclist winning a big event in Mexico over the weekend. You know, and the question Starmer doesn't want to ask, sort of answer in any way at all, is, is a trans woman a woman so look when i see uh, men participating in women's sports when i see records being broken like you say the big event with the cyclist yeah. uh, and pretty easily pretty easy victory from what i understand uh, i think it's very unfair i think it's very disrespectful actually to women i talk about it all the time i don't do it for applause but I will say one of the biggest hands I get is when I say we will not allow men to 
compete in women's sports. Weightlifting, swimming, running. It's so unfair. I think it's totally disrespect. And the records are being broken, like sometimes by a lot. And I think it's a very bad thing. Yeah, I mean, this, this actually appears to be at the moment maybe maybe Starmer's Achilles heel because we've seen with Sturgeon how public opinion changed yeah. on gender recognition. Yeah. But, you know, I look at your life. You've got the best portfolio of golf courses anyone's ever owned. And, and other things, you're right. You've got a lovely yeah, wife, great. great kids, great relationship, <laughs> wonderful life. You've been successful. You've got enough money to enjoy yourself and do what you want. And you're going to give it all up again to run for president. Well, we have an interesting situation. Our country was doing fantastically well. Uh, we got hit with the uh, gift from China, the China virus or COVID, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we rebuilt it back again. Our stock market was actually higher when I left than it was just pre-COVID coming in, which is incredible. Uh, we did a great job. We had the greatest economy in the history of our country and probably in the history of the world. We probably had the greatest for that period of the long period of time just before COVID came in and then got it back again. And now it's really going bad. Our country is really in trouble. And I can turn it around very quickly. I have a phrase, make America great again. And I got hit with that a lot of times during the course here. They were saying, you know, yeah. make UK great again. So I don't know what's going on over here, but there's some people feel. Well, I think we're copying a lot of the bad leads we get from America. Yeah. And, and America is the leader of the free world. Whether people like that or not, it's actually true yeah. in every way. But, you know, way, you are copying that. And you know, when you talk about the transgender, when you talk about yeah, no, no, different no, 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 no. things, you I, seem to be the, right behind us. The commonalities are yeah. remarkable. And I think culturally. I think the countries are closer together now than they've probably ever been. Mm -hmm. Right now they're destroying our country. Our country is being destroyed very much like, I think to a much lesser extent, your country is being hurt very badly. But, but our country is being destroyed. They're trying to destroy you, aren't they? I mean, I saw that photograph of you. And I've, you know, I've met you before when you were going through tough times as president, when they just kept on you. And frankly, I don't know anybody that could have withstood it, but you did. You yep. kept going right through. And we had a great presidency. Look, I got the biggest tax of tax credits. Take a look at what we did in terms of tax cuts. Mm -hmm. We got the biggest tax cuts in history, biggest regulation cuts in history, rebuilt the military, created Space Force. We did things that nobody thought were possible to do. Uh, had the strongest border we've ever had. Now we have the worst border probably in the history of the world. There's no country in the world that has a border like we have. Yeah, six million. Drugs were way down. People coming in illegally were at the lowest point we've ever had. Uh, we did a great job as president, and people want that back. Now you would say, why would you do this? <coughs> yeah. You won't be able to be back here for a long yeah. period of time. Yeah. And it was really, being a Turnberry was such a great... A great thing, a thrill to see how beautiful and how magnificent it is. And, you know, we, our hand has been just more than just touching it. We did a real job here. And it is hard, too, because, you know, you're running and you're, you're competing against China. You're competing against everybody. We have a lot of danger out there. We have, I believe this right now, the world is in the most dangerous place it's ever been in because of the power of weapons. And that includes nuclear, obviously. And... We have a person in the United States that doesn't have a clue. And people say, why do you want to do it again? And I'm leading in the polls, as you know, by a lot, uh, because people want that. They want back what we had. They want uh, stability. They want the economy. They want jobs. They w we had the greatest number of jobs in the history of our country. We had everything was top, whether you had a diploma or you didn't have a diploma, whether you were a PhD from Harvard, MIT, the Wharton School of Finance, or you didn't have a high school diploma, everybody was working, African American, Asian American, Hispanic American. We had the greatest, it was the greatest period of time, that period of time just prior to COVID. Until COVID came in, I got along great yeah. with President Xi. I got along great with President Putin. Putin never would have gone into Ukraine. If, if it weren't for the incompetence of this administration, this current administration, Putin was not going in. It was never mentioned. He, and I knew him very well. I got along with him well and she well and uh, Kim Jong-un. I got along with him well. If Obama were president for a little bit longer, you would have had a nuclear war with North Korea, in my opinion, okay? I think in his opinion, too, he thought it was the most dangerous thing. I got along great with Kim Jong-un. Now, Putin, I mean, Putin, today, they're saying there's been an attempted drone strike by the Ukrainians on the Kremlin. 
we don't yet know the full truth. Of, have you seen that story? I have not seen it yet. Okay, right. Well, you know, that, that's, that's a big story. That's yeah. I mean, they're quite small drones, but let's that's see what big story. the truth of it is. Yeah. There's a growing, I sense in America, unhappiness about the money that's been given to Ukraine. Yeah. Why does nobody talk about peace and peace negotiations? So if I were president, <clears throat> and I say this, I will end that war in one day. It'll take 24 hours. I know Zelensky well. I know Putin well. I would get that ended in a you period can, of You can break that deal. 100%. It would be easy. That deal would be easy. A lot of it has to do with the money. A lot of it has to do with the military, you know, that yeah. we're giving. But I would get that deal done within 24 hours. That war has to be stopped. That war is a disaster. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm talking more than money. I'm talking about the human life. It's far greater than anyone thinks. Uh, there's a lot of people being okay. killed. You don't knock down a whole city and say two people got hurt. Right. Okay. Thousands of people are being killed in these cities that are being knocked down. Yeah. They're in those big apartment houses, and they are big buildings. I'm a very good real estate guy. I know what a big... These are massive buildings. I'm actually surprised to see. And when you see those buildings just collapsing, thousands of people are being <coughs> killed that yeah. nobody's talking about. Uh, that war has to stop. Well, I, I, I think we'd all love to see that war stop and the threats end. Look, we're going to get energy prices down. We're going to get taxes down. We're going to get interest rates down. Our country's gone crazy. Interest rates are through the roof. Taxes are through the roof. They want to quadruple taxes in the United States. Now, historically, that's been a very bad thing if you're a politician. We're going to raise your taxes. Think of it. We're going to raise your taxes. And... They're supposed to win. The way they win is by cheating. And you have to learn by history. You can't just say, well, we're not going to talk about something anymore. I talk about positive. Energy's coming down. Interest rates are coming down. You're going to be able to get your homes again. Right now, people can't buy a home. So this is, this is the pitch. Well, this that's, is the pitch that's part of it. The economy was great. And yeah. we're going to have a strong border. Our border is pathetic. We will have, at the end of this year, 15 million people, in my opinion, come into the country. 15 million. That's bigger than New York State. They come from mental institutions. They come from prisons, jails. They come from everywhere. We have no idea. And some seeking a better life. Sure, some seeking a better life. But how many? Look, if you look at the prisons, if you look at mental institutions all over the world, they're being emptied out into our country because we have an incompetent president. That man is incompetent, and it's a shame. And he's not running it anyway. People around him, a very smart group of Marxists or communists or whatever you want to call them, around them, that's who's running our country. He's not running the country. He's now in Delaware sleeping. Final he can't even come to your coronation as a country. Your coronation's a big event. Hopefully that won't take place for another long time. He'll live a good life and she'll live a good life and it'll be a long time. But that's a big event. That's a big event. And when you have somebody that's going to be sleeping instead of coming to the coronation as president of the United States, I think that's I think it's a bad thing. And one of the reasons other countries seem to be going now with China, it's crazy to think of it. You'll probably be next when the president doesn't come to a coronation of the new king and queen of your country, how, how is that possible? The reason is he's sleeping. <laughs> Shouldn't happen. Final thought. Are you going to win next year? I think we have a very good chance. Uh, the economy is not good. I'll make it good. Everyone knows. You know, everyone knows. They, even Democrats, they say, well, we agree that Putin would have never gone in. He would have. I told him, you're not going in. Putin would have never gone into Ukraine. President Xi of China would never even be talking about Taiwan. We had that conversation strongly. Uh, I stopped uh, North Korea from doing some really bad things. And my relationship with Kim Jong-un is very good. Who knows what's going to happen there? Iran was going to make a great deal. They were going to be happy. I was going to be happy. We're going to have a great relationship. Now they're out of control. They're totally out of control. This world is blowing up around us. It's blowing up around us. You may even lose the dollar as the standard throughout the world. And if you lose the dollar standard, that's like losing a war. In many ways, it's worse than losing a war. Uh, yeah, I think we have a very good chance. I think when People and people feel it in their pocketbooks. Everyone's saying, you know, Trump's going to turn the economy around. I did it. Actually, I did it twice, if you think about it, because I did it after COVID. 
But we had the greatest economy in the history of the world, and I'll be able to do that again quickly and easily. Energy is going to come down. Interest rates are coming down. And you know what else? We're going to have we're going to get rid of crime because our cities, Democrat run, are crime infested rat holes. Donald Trump, thank you for joining me. Thank you very much. Our national debt now stands at about $32 trillion. How did we get here? Whose fault is it? Republicans? Democrats? Well, the answer is yes. Both parties are at fault for different reasons. Republicans come to this floor and will come to this floor today saying, we need unlimited military spending. And Democrats will come to this floor and say, we need unlimited welfare spending. And guess what happens? They compromise. People say Washington doesn't compromise. They compromise all of the time. That's what this debt deal, debt deal that's before us is, is compromise. But the compromise is always to spend more money. How do we know that? The debt deal that's been crafted by Biden and McCarthy is an unlimited increase in the debt ceiling. See, historically, when we raised the debt ceiling, it would be $100 billion or $200 billion or, God forbid, a trillion dollars. It was a dollar amount. This debt ceiling will go up till January 2025. How many dollars will be borrowed? As many as they can possibly shovel out the door. It will be how much money can you shovel out the door until January 2025? That's how much we will spend. Is there a dollar amount? No. How much can you shovel it out and how fast can you shovel it out? There will be no restraint from this debt deal. There is a pretense. There is a playing around the edges as if, oh, there might be a cut here or there might be a cut there. There are no cuts. Why? Two-thirds of your spending is entitlement spending. The on-budget entitlement spending is Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps, and other programs. They are called mandatory and no one ever looks at them. They go on in perpetuity. This is what drives the deficit. Who took them off the table? How come there's no discussion of this? Actually, Republicans took them off the table because they fear being criticized by the Democrats. It's being used in the presidential campaign. Let's not talk about the entitlements, but that's two-thirds of what gets spent every year. So if you don't talk about the entitlements, if you don't talk about mandatory spending, you're frankly not a serious person, and you will not make a serious dent in this problem. So we've taken off the table all mandatory spending, no discussion of it. Does this mean they're in good shape, that Medicare and Social Security and all these programs are in good shape? Heck no, they're not in good shape. They're all running out of money. They're headed towards bankruptcy. Is anybody brave enough to reform them? No, not a damn thing's going to be done for any of them. But when you take them off the table, take all the entitlement spending off the table and do nothing about it, now we're down to one-third of the budget. So now you're going to try to do budgetary reform while excluding two-thirds of the spending on one-third. But it's worse than that. The one-third they call discretionary spending. It's about $1.6 trillion. Half of that's military. So they took that off the table. So mandatory spending entitlements is going up 5% under this deal, because that's what it's been doing for, for years and years. It's going up at 5%. Military is going up at 3%. So what are we left for? What are we left looking at? We're looking at one-sixth of the budget. Somewhere between 15 and 20 percent, a small sliver of the budget, it's called non-military discretionary, and they think we're going to do some kind of fiscal reform on that small sliver of government. Well, guess what? You can't do it. You can eliminate all of the non-military discretionary money. Leave the mandatory in place, leave the military in place, increase them, eliminate all of this other chunk of money, and you still never balance the budget. See, there was a time when there was a conservative movement, and the conservative movement had a voice in Washington, there's still some voice, but not much, but there was a time when people on the conservative side of this said, well, in order to be a thoughtful, rational, realistic, strong response to the budget deficit, you would have to balance your budget in five years. In fact, we voted on a constitutional amendment in this body, and every Republican voted for it, but it said you had to balance five years. 
Why five years? Well, because most of the plans that lasted longer than that, most of the plans that balanced in like years nine and 10, were basically somebody fudging the numbers and hoping something good would happen in year nine or 10, but the only years they actually had any power over the first year or two, there weren't very many cuts. And they always had unrealistic expectations in year 10. So what have I done? I've said, let's look at balancing this in five years. What would it take? So about five or six years ago, I began introducing something called the penny plan. And what would it do? It would cut one penny out of every dollar. It actually would balance. Actually, the first year I did it, it didn't even cut 1%. I froze spending for five years, and the, balance, the budget would have balanced. But the trick is, or not the trick, the truth is that you have to cut all spending or freeze all spending. You can't just freeze a sliver of the spending. So people have talked about, oh, there's a 1% trigger on the, non, on the discretionary spending. That's $16 billion. They're going to add $4 trillion in debt over the next two years. And they say, but by golly, we might save $16 billion, which even that is not going to happen because the trigger isn't real, doesn't have muscle, and will be evaded. But the thing is, is that if we were to balance the budget over five years, what would happen is there now needs to be about a 5% cut of all the spending each year for five years, and then the budget would balance. And you say, well, isn't it just a number? What would that mean to real people? Why do I care whether the budget is balanced? Well, go to the grocery store. Go to buy gas. Go to buy anything. Go to pay your rent. Look at your cost of living, and look at what inflation is doing to you. Who does inflation hurt the worst? Those on fixed income and those of the working class because they don't have extra expendable income. Most of their income goes towards things that they have to purchase each month. But where does inflation come from? A senator from Indiana described it accurately. We run a debt, this place spends money we don't have, and where's the deficit made up for? We sell that debt to the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve buys it, and he's like, wow, this is a great system. We spend money we don't have, we pr print up these things called treasury bills, the Federal Reserve comes over and then buys them, Wow, we can just do anything we want. We have the printing press. But when they create new money and that new money enters into circulation, that is inflation. Inflation is an increase in the money supply. And when you increase the money supply, you chase the same amount of goods, you're going to chase the prices right up. And that's where inflation comes from. So the debt is not just a number. The debt is about the value of your paycheck. It's about how far your paycheck goes. So right now, we're in a bit of a spiral. We've had 9% inflation. It's a little lower now, but we've had as high as 9%. And I think the cost of living increase for Social Security went up 9 to match that. But you'll actually find people who say, you know, even with the 9% increase, I still can't buy everything I need. I'm actually still being squeezed. But it's a bait and switch. It's because your government isn't honest with you. If your government wanted to be honest with you and they say, we're going to be everything to everyone and we're going to give you stuff, and it's funny because we have this comparison sometimes with Sweden, and people say, and many Democrats will say, we want to be Sweden, we want to be Sweden, and we're going to give you everything, and we're going to have a big government that coddles you from, from cradle to grave. But you know how they do it in Sweden? With a balanced budget. And I'm not advocating we become Sweden, but they balance their annual budget every year. You know how they, got, they have all that free stuff to give everybody? How they have a safety net that includes everything, including college, free health care, everything? They tax everybody, enormous amount of tax. Over here, the bait and switch is they'll say, we're just going to tax the rich people. It's easy. Just tax the rich people. They don't do that in Sweden, though. In Sweden, they tax everybody. It's a 60% income tax beginning at $60,000 a year. So everybody pays. The middle class pays. So if we wanted to be honest and we we're going to say, we're going to give you this massive safety net. You don't have to work. Everybody can have a basic income. You do all of this we would be honest, or we should be honest, and say it would take massive taxes. Instead, there's a dishonesty, but the dishonesty is on both sides of the aisle. The Democrats say welfare is free, and the safety net's free, and Social Security's free, and all these things are free. What do Republicans say? The military-industrial complex is free. You can have all the weapons you want. You can give hundreds of billions of dollars of weapons to Ukraine, and it won't cost anything, because we'll just print it up. See, there were times in our history when you went through a war, and the devastation of war in World War II, that people actually suffered, and you could see the suffering, and people felt like they had to pay something. But now we just put it on the tab. But there is a point at which the tab gets so large that there can be something precipitous happen. The question has always been, 
Is this a gradual problem where we'll just have to deal with a little inflation, 5%, 10% here, or is there a point at which there's a calamity? If you look at the stock market for the last 100 years, uh, some people will point to like seven different days in which like 80, 90% of the downturn occurred in seven days in the last century. Is there a possibility of calamity when we're so destructive to our dollar, when we're so destructive to good sense? I think the American people want more from us. Recent polls have said 60% of Americans say don't raise the debt ceiling without significant reform. 43 Republicans, 44 of us actually said we want significant reforms before we raise the debt ceiling. But then the devil's in the details. The devil's in concluding what is significant and what is not significant. So what will end up happening, my prediction here is almost every Democrat will vote, vote to raise the debt ceiling and about half of the Republicans will vote. It'll be a 75-25 vote and in the end, the debt ceiling will go up. People say, well, that's good. We didn't have a calamity. We didn't, the stock market didn't crash because we didn't pay our debt. But you might want to ask yourself, is this really a contrived controversy? Is there really a reason in which we would ever default? Is there a reason why we wouldn't make our interest payment? We bring in $5 trillion and our interest payment's $500 billion. So that would be like you make $100,000 and your mortgage payment's $10,000. If you made $100,000 a year and your mortgage payment was at $10,000, is there any chance you would ever default? Is there any reason you wouldn't cut your other expenditures to prioritize your interest so you don't get kicked out of your house? That's what every American family would do, but we don't do it up here. So we threaten default. We scare the markets and say, oh, no, we'll default if the debt ceiling doesn't come up. No, we would default only if we refuse to cut spending. So we spend a trillion dollars more than comes in every year. That's the problem. If we simply said, we're going to pay the $500 billion, 10% of our revenue for next year, we're going to pay the interest no matter what, and guess what? We'll tell the marketplace we're never going to default. We are, we are never going to default. We will always do that. That would be great. The market would go gangbusters and say, we no longer have to worry about those knuckleheads. They've finally decided they're going to pay their interest, and they always will. Then what would happen? Well, we wouldn't have enough money for everything. So then we, we should look at where we could save money. The problem has always been this. Republicans point at Democrats and say, we don't like your programs, let's cut your programs. Democrats look at Republicans and say, no, no, don't cut our programs, cut yours. Everybody's don't cut mine, cut yours. That's why I've taken the approach and continue to take the approach, we should cut everything across the board. In the past, there were always like conservatives who say, let's get rid of public television, let's get rid of Sesame Street and Big Bird, and they'd get so much grief over it, it's like, why do that? You, you're not balancing the budget over Big Bird. Take 1% of Big Bird's budget. Take 1% of everybody's budget. And what would, that, what would that bring about? It would bring about more conservation of the dollar. It would bring about more restraint and more reform. I'll end with this. People say, where would you cut? I would say everywhere. But I can give you, on the tip of my hand, ridiculous stuff that should have 100% cut but is never cut and goes on and on. In the early 1970s, William Proxmire, a conservative Democrat, pointed out that the National Science Foundation was spending $50,000 to study what makes people fall in love. Now that's a better, I think, topic for Cosmopolitan magazine than it is for a government study. Nowadays, it's gone up. We spent a million dollars having young people take selfies of themselves while smiling and then looking at it later in the day to see if looking at pictures of yourself smiling makes you a happier person. That cost you a million bucks. We spent a million and a half studying the mating call of the Panamanian frog to see if the mating call of the country frogs was different than the city frogs. We spent nearly a million dollars studying the Japanese quail to see if they're more sexually promiscuous when they're on cocaine. I think we could have just polled the audience on that one. This is the kind of ridiculous stuff, but does it get better? I complain about this every year and all the time, and everybody shakes their head and says, no way, why are we doing that? The National Science Foundation, we increased their budget 50% last year. People said, oh, we have to compete with China, so let's give the National Science Foundation more money. We, we've almost 
increase their budget by 50%. The people are studying why you go on dates, why you're happy, why the male frogs, you know, what their mating call is. This is the craziness, but it never gets better because we always spend more money. So my amendment would do this. My amendment would reduce the spending in real terms. We'd actually spend less money next year than last year. It'd be a 5% reduction in money and you'd spend less each year and over five years you'd balance your budget and then we'd be on course to balance. People say, why not? Who can do this? Half of Europe does it. Sweden balances their budget. Germany balances their budget. Over half of the countries of Europe run an annual balanced budget. Our profligacy and our spending is catching up to us. I say we act now and I recommend a yes vote on my amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Kennedy, I'd like to ask you what you think of Dean Rusk's recent claim that the effect of anti-Vietnam War demonstrations in the States may actually be to prolong the war rather than to shorten it. Uh, the war is going on in Vietnam, being extended in Vietnam, really because of the determination of uh, those who are our adversaries, the uh, North Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, National Liberation Front. I don't think a particular action takes place, military action takes place in South Vietnam because of uh, the uh, protests uh, here in the United States. I think that even if all the protests were ended and even if all of the objections to the war uh, came to an end here in this country, that the war in Vietnam would continue. I'm sure to some extent the fact that there are some protests uh, gives some encouragement to Ho Chi Minh and to others. But I, don't, I certainly don't think that that's the reason that the war is continuing and why the casualties are going up. Well, I definitely think that the uh uh, demonstrations are prolonging the uh, war in that they're giving the enemy, who I believe must face uh, defeat on relative uh, comparison of the power of the two nations. Uh, they're giving him encouragement to continue to um, hold out on the hope that uh, division here in America will bring about a peace without defeat uh, for that enemy. Many of the demonstrations now taking place in this country could not legally take place if there was a legal declaration of war. So um, we, I think, are faced with a, uh, with a choice here. But uh, again, and I'm sure the senator agrees with me, uh, America will jealously guard uh, this right of dissent because I think the greatness of our country has been based on our thinking that uh, everyone has a right even to be wrong. I'm Charles Collingwood, and this is Town Meeting of the World the latest in an occasional series of transatlantic confrontations that's been going on ever since communication satellites made them possible. With me here in the studio of the BBC in London are a group of young people, university students from the one from the United States, but uh, the rest of them from uh, Europe, Africa, and Asia. They are all attending universities in Great Britain, they have ideas, all of them, sometimes provocative ones, about the United States, its role, and its image. For the next hour, via the Atlantic Communications Satellite, they will be participating in a global dialogue with Senator Robert F. Kennedy, Democrat of New York, and Governor Ronald Reagan, Republican of California. This is another in the CBS News series, Town Meeting of the World. Tonight's subject the image of America and the youth of the world. We'll be back in a moment. When something tastes really good, you want the taste to last longer. It does with a seven-minute cigarette. Pell-Mell Gold 100s. It's the longest length you can get in a filter cigarette with seven minutes of good, mild taste. If you've got the time, Pell-Mell's got the cigarette. The seven minute cigarette, Pell Mell Gold 100s, mild taste in a longer length. Cleaning alone may not be effective against household germs that can cause odors and illness, but Lysol is. Just add a few caps full of Lysol to your cleaning water. It's the most effective way to kill household germs and the odors they cause. Prevents mold, mildew, prevents odors all around the house. Lysol even helps protect baby's crib against many disease germs. Fast, easy, most effective way to fight household germs, prevent mold, mildew, and the odors they cause. Lysol brand disinfectant. I believe the war in Vietnam is illegal, immoral, politically unjustifiable, 
and economically motivated. Could either of you agree with this? Who wants to start, Senator Kennedy? I don't agree with that. Uh, I, uh, I have some reservations, as I've stated them before, about uh, some aspects of the war. But I think that the uh, United States is making every effort to try to uh, make it possible for the people of South Vietnam to determine their own destiny. I think that's all we want, uh, no matter how, uh, how we, uh, what reservations we have about the conduct of the war. I think we're all agreed uh, in the United States that uh, if the war can be settled and the people of South Vietnam can determine uh, their own destiny and determine their own future, that we want to leave South Vietnam. That's the stated uh, governmental policy. It's certainly what I would like to see, and I think that's backed by the vast majority of American people. Uh, the fact is that uh, the uh, insurgency against, uh, that's taking place in uh, South Vietnam is being supported by North Vietnam. If both of us withdraw and let the people of South Vietnam determine and decide what they want, what kind of government they want, what kind of future they want, uh, what kind of economic system they want to establish, I think that's all we're interested in. That's all we're interested in accomplishing. So I think it's quite different than you've described it. Governor Reagan, what about you? Well, I think we're, we're very much in agreement on this, that uh, this country of ours uh, has a long history of non-aggression, but also a willingness to befriend and go to the aid of those who would uh, want to be free and determine their own destiny. Now, I think all of us are agreed that war is probably man's greatest stupidity. And I think uh, peace is the dream that lives in the heart of everyone, wherever he may be in the world. But unfortunately, unlike a family quarrel, it doesn't take uh, two to make a war. It only takes one, uh, unless the other one is prepared to surrender at the first hint of force. Uh, I do believe that our goal is the right of a people to self-determination and to not have a way of life, a government, or a system forced upon them. Mr. Regan, just five minutes ago on this program you said Every man has the right of dissent, and I believe that every man has the right to be wrong. No doubt you'd also support the American ideal of freedom. Now, following on this, I want to ask you whether in fact you would support the people who at the moment you say are dodging the draft, and whether you would go on record as supporting people who claim to be conscientious objectors as a means for not joining the war in Vietnam. Oh, now wait a minute. Uh, I thank you for giving me a chance if I left a wrong impression. Uh, we agree in this country of the right of people to be wrong. But as I said before, taking advantage of the technicality that we are not legally in a state of war, we have people doing things with which I am in great disagreement. Uh, I do not believe in those who are resisting the draft. Uh, now, we draw a line between the conscientious objector on religious grounds. With our great belief in religious freedom in our country, we have always said to those whose religion specifically prohibits them, such as our Quakers, from taking human life, we offer them military service in the non-combat roles, such as being medics and so forth. And they have a great and honorable history, people of this kind of serving in our wars in that capacity. But I believe if government is to mean anything at all, that all of us have a responsibility once the action has been decided upon, and supposedly by the majority will, that we then, while reserving our right to disagree, we support the collective or the unified effort uh, of the nation. Uh, otherwise, uh, all law and order and all uh, uh, government breaks down because we might have a citizen who has a conscientious objection to paying taxes. And if we allow our citizens to voluntarily quit paying taxes, government breaks down. Or obeying the law or anything else that uh, may come along. Uh, we give up certain individual freedoms in the interest of um, well, I suppose it comes from our own constitution, our idea that every American or every person has the right, is born with the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But my pursuit of happiness, if it comes from swinging my arm, I must stop swinging my arm just short of the end of your nose. Uh, Senator Kennedy, anything you want to add to that? Well, I expect I uh, disagree somewhat with the uh, governor. Uh, I don't think that uh, we're automatically correct or automatically right and, and morality is on our side or God is automatically on our side because we're involved in a war. Uh, I don't think that uh, the mere fact that the United States is involved in the use of force with an adversary uh, makes everything that the United States then does absolutely correct. So I, uh, the idea that we're involved in this kind of a struggle uh, 
if there are those within the United States that feel that the struggle could be ended more rapidly with uh, less loss of life, uh, that the uh, terror and the uh, destruction would be less if we took a different course then I think that they should make their views known. I don't think they're less patriotic because they feel that. In fact, I think that they would be less patriotic if they didn't uh, state their views and give their ideas. Just uh, because the, uh, the United States is involved in this kind of a conflict as we are at the present time, not to state any opposition or say that we can't state an opposition because of the, uh, uh, the fact that we're involved in a struggle, I think is, a, uh, is, an, is uh, an error. Uh, this is a difficult period of time, but the mere fact that we're shooting one another uh, across the world uh, doesn't make the United States automatically right. I think it should be examined. It doesn't make uh, the course that we are following at the present time automatically right, automatically correct. And I think that those uh, who uh, have a different point of view, no matter what their point of view might be, whether they are in favor in, in using increased force are in favor of uh, lessening the force, uh, or even uh, as some uh, of uh, pulling out unilaterally. I happen to disagree with that, but I think that they have a responsibility and a right to state those views, even though we're in a difficult period of time. Would you uh, draw Mr. the Garland line at draft the dodging, though? I, uh, yes, Mr. Reagan. Well, I just, uh, again, apparently I haven't made myself clear. And Senator, I want to make it plain this. No, as I say, we have reserved the right of dissent. But when that dissent takes the form of actions that actually aid the enemy, uh, the enemy that is engaged in killing our forces, such as uh, avoiding the draft, refusing service, uh, blocking troop uh, trains and uh, shipments of munitions, as we've had uh, uh, here in this country by some demonstrators, uh, this is going beyond the dissent that is provided in our present governmental system, whereby any American can stand up, protest, can uh, uh, convey his feelings to the legislature or to the duly uh, organized government uh, in an effort to get the government to change its course. But again, it must stop short of lending comfort and aid to an enemy uh, that is presently engaged in forceful activities against our country. Uh, uh, Arshad Mahmoud of Pakistan. Um, Walter Few a moment ago defended the right of self-determination of people and the right of dissent. I was wondering, given the assumption that North Vietnam and South Vietnam can be brought to the conference table, would you advocate that the National Liberation Front be given a uh, place in the, in the negotiation or in the conference? Is that, uh, who is that directed at? Well, why don't you start, Senator? I've uh, said before that I'm in favor of the National Liberation Front being represented at the conference table, that they come to the conference table, that they take place, they take a part in the discussions. Uh, they have been involved in the struggle for a long period of time. I don't think that we can arrive at any meaningful peace. Uh, I don't think we can have any negotiations that really are going to be very productive unless the National Liberation Front is represented and I would therefore be in favor of the National Liberation Front, who is the political arm of those who are providing most of the troops, most of the force, most of the effort in the South, uh, being represented at the conference table. Governor? Well, here we're in disagreement. Uh, I believe if there is any negotiation involving the Viet Cong, that that is between the Viet Cong and the South Vietnamese government in a negotiation of their own because the Viet Cong is in the position of being a rebellious force, an illegal force, uh, fighting against the duly authorized government of its own nation. And to sit them down at a negotiating table between two nations, North and South Vietnam, who are engaged in a conflict, is uh, tipping the scales. I doubt if we, if we wanted to draw a parallel... Do you think the United States should be represented then? N no, if you're going to have a negotiation between North and South Vietnam... No, but if you're, have a negotiation, if you're going to have negotiations to end the war, North Vietnam, South Vietnam is going to be represented. Should the United States and the National Liberation Front be there? Well, I don't, um, th I don't think you can have a, a, a rebel force that is engaged in criminal activity uh, having the distinction of sitting at the table as, as one of the representatives. Um, I'm sorry, but you say that you believe in self-determination and that this lovely idea of let everybody decide for themselves. Yet, in, the, in Vietnam, in 1954, you refused to sign the Geneva Convention. You refused to allow um, independent elections in Vietnam. 
You forced the Diem regime onto the Vietnamese people. It was hated by the Vietnamese people. It put six million in forced prison camps. This was your puppet regime and you supported it. You've refused to come to the negotiations with the Viet Cong and, and you've shown that every time you ask for a peace talk, all you do is escalate the war. This is only one example of Vietnam. You've got the example of the CIA overthrowing the, the Jagan government. You've got the example of it giving 104 million pounds aid, military aid, to Greece. There are so many examples of America refusing to allow a people to determine for itself what government it would have. Now, I, are you talking about a people determining what government they'll have, or are you talking about a faction within a country that wants to take over and dictate the system to a country? Now, I disagree, talking, I disagree. About the Diem regime, would you say that the Diem regime was a popular one, or was it one which you imposed on a people and which the people then rebelled against? I doubt that you could make much of a case. I challenge your history. In 1954, there was the history of the Diem regime, sir. I do, because there was a referendum taken in 1954, in which 90% of the people voted in a referendum for Diem to take the position that he took. He was subsequently endorsed in two other elections, uh, a few years apart, in which they elected both a general assembly for his government that was preponderantly pro Diem. Uh, they re-elected him to his position. We could hardly have installed a puppet regime at a time when we had less than 700 unarmed military advisors, many of them non-commissioned officers, helping to teach the South Vietnamese how to organize an army for protection against guerrillas in their own country. Are you, are you saying that you, you uh, approve of the activities of the Diem regime? What activities? You approve that they put six million in forced prison camps and that the American advisors uh, did nothing uh, but help them in this. I challenge your history again. There is absolutely no record that six million people were put in concentration camps. They only have 16 million to begin with. Now, I'd also like to challenge something else about the so supposed evils of the, the uh, Diem regime. I do approve of Diem's land reform, in which he took from the great uh, Mandarin uh, holdings and began to make land available. Uh, to the peasants and to the people of Vietnam who had never owned land before. Oh. But also, I would like to call to your attention that a team from the United Nations was sent to Saigon, to Vietnam, to investigate the charges made against the Diem regime. They did investigate those, but as they returned to this country, Diem was assassinated, which I think was one of the great tragedies of this whole conflict. And the United Nations report, which they declined to make official because they thought, why bring anything up now that he's been killed, has, on the other hand, been published. There has been public access to it. And the United Nations report completely cleared the Diem regime of any of the charges that had been brought against it. Governor, let's get Senator Kennedy in on this. We haven't heard on him for a while. What about uh, your answer to Jordan's question, Senator? Well, why doesn't somebody ask me a question and then I'll, I'll answer it specifically? All right. Well, can, I, I, can I ask you the well, question then? <laughs> Hands yeah. sprout up again. Go the ahead, self determination Jordan. principle of which Mr. Reagan made use yeah, I, I seems understand. to me to be violated by America's record in Vietnam, by its refusal to allow free elections, which was the suggestion of the Geneva Convention, by its supporting of. Okay, well, I understand now. I understand. I would say that uh, there are, as I've said before, I think that there were mistakes that were made over the period of the last 10 years. There were mistakes in which I was involved. Excuse me? Sorry, do you regard it as a mistake that a million civilians have been killed? If there are million civilians have been killed, I would regard it as a mistake. Uh, I think that the civilians being killed in North Vietnam or South Vietnam, I think the terrorism that existed in North Vietnam was a mistake. I think the terrorism uh, and the killings that took place in Hungary uh, during the 1950s were, were a mistake, and I think that some of the actions of uh, President GM in South Vietnam were a mistake. I think that the United States at various times has been associated with governments uh, uh, which do not represent the will and the wish and, uh, of the people, and I think that is most unfortunate. But uh, I, I don't go on this program, and I don't think Governor Reagan goes on the program with saying uh, that we've never made a mistake and that we've never erred, because I think that we have. 
But if we look at the present time, if I might say to you, if we look at the present time, the fact is uh, the United States is willing to uh, have elections in South Vietnam, are willing to abide by the result of those elections, are willing to uh, permit an outside group to come in and supervise the elections, and it's the North Vietnamese that uh, are unwilling to accept that. Let me also say, if you want to criticize President GM, I think that at the same time, I would suggest that perhaps you could also criticize uh, uh, North Vietnam. When did they last have a free election? When did they fr uh, last have a free election in any of the countries who are adversaries? Now, I agree that our standard that we hold up to the rest of the world might be higher and might be different, and therefore we have a greater responsibility to adhere to it. And at times we have not. In our relationships with some of the countries of Latin America, Asia and Africa, uh, but, uh, I'm, and I'd be glad to go into uh, what I think the explanation of that is. But I don't say that we are without fault. I don't say that even the administration uh, that I was involved with, President Kennedy, was out without fault in our policy toward Vietnam, but nor has North Vietnam. And the other important point is, which I think that you should accept and have to accept, is the fact that we are willing at the present time to abide by elections. We've stated it quite clearly and then we're willing to permit an outside group to come in and supervise it. Can Senator I just Kennedy, make one I thing, sir. You, the, you, I don't know who you mean by we, but President Johnson and certainly uh, Governor Reagan isn't prepared to have realistic negotiations uh, with the Viet Cong, who you agree ought to be at the conference table. While they're spending $20 billion a year destroying the country, and while your government and your 20, party 20, refuses... It's, you're wrong, your you're, figures again. It's about $25 billion. Oh, well, <laughs> splendid. $25 billion. But I wouldn't say... 20, that, let me just say this. Let's also... This doesn't do any good for any of us to get an exaggeration. We're not spending $25 billion to destroy the country. We feel very strongly in the United States, and you can smile if you wish, but except uh, I, we listen to you. Just listen to us for a second. We, uh, we want the people of South Vietnam. Again, Governor Reagan and I have some differences, and, and I have perhaps differences with others, uh, but, uh, and, uh, but the fact is that we do agree that we will abide by the results of elections in South Vietnam. That's all we're interested in South Vietnam. The people make their own determination. President Johnson has said publicly that he's willing to abide by the elections, that even if the communists take over the country, that the United States will withdraw. Now, if the North Vietnamese, which should make a public statement now, will abide by the elections, and, uh, and we'll have elections there in 60 days, and we'll have the ICC come in and supervise the elections, then I think that, uh, and, and we then back down, then I think there's more point to your statement. But, I, but we're this, willing, we've held out the challenge that we're willing to abide by the election. If that's, what you, if that's where you put your emphasis. Can I think it's much more complicated. If this doesn't happen, if this doesn't happen right. in 60 days, can we take it that I'm right? Excuse me? <laughs> you said, sir, that if this doesn't happen in 60 days, there's a point to my question. No, but if the you North might... Vietnamese, will the North Vietnamese have, agree to elections? Can you deliver the North Vietnamese? Well, Senator, Kennedy, can I... to fight. Senator Kennedy, can I ask you something about these elections? Because what I understand from meeting the American press is that in the elections that have recently been held in South Vietnam, no one that the government considered in its own opinion was either a neutralist or a communist was allowed to stand. Yes, and that's right. There was also considerable intimidation. That's now, it right. seems to me that if you're, you, you accuse us of being inconsistent, if you're going to accuse North Vietnam of not holding free elections, then you should condemn the South Vietnam government that President Johnson is supporting for holding elections that are equally as farcical as anything that ever happened in any communist well, country. Let me just say this. I said at the beginning that there were uh, mistakes and uh, things done that I would uh, disagree with in South Vietnam. I'm just saying, and I don't Think, and I agree your, with your criticism of the elections of South Vietnam, as I have said before. I don't think that's the point. The point is uh, uh, that we have said that we'd be willing to abide by the result of the elections. And I don't say that the elections that have been held have been free elections. You're absolutely right. The government of South Vietnam has not permitted neutralists or communists to, or people from the National Liberation Front to participate in the elections that have held in the past. But we have said the United States policy has been that if the North Vietnamese will agree to it, the National Liberation Front will agree to it, that we will agree to hold elections in which all parties will participate in South Vietnam and let the people themselves determine their own destiny. I said that I'm sure we'd be willing to do that in 60 days if you can get Mr. Ho Chi Minh and the head of the National Liberation Front to participate with us. That is, that's the challenge I'm offering to you. Mr. Graziani of Italy. Yes. I mean, I think this is very relevant. I think what we want to know is what the Americans are doing in Vietnam. I think what we want to know is 
what rights they have to be there. By going there, they have breached the UN Charter, the US Constitution, and the Geneva Agreements. What can you say about that? Well, I don't think they have uh, breached any of those agreements. As a matter of fact, uh, by the Geneva Agreement, two countries were created with a 17th parallel dividing them. No, no, uh, no. A million people, a million people fled across the border to South Vietnam. Can I now, uh, a passage from the Geneva Agreement. The 17th parallel dividing North from South Vietnam is mere provisional military demarcation line and should not in any way be interpreted as constituting a political or territorial boundary. The introduction into Vietnam of foreign troops and military personnel, arms and ammunition is prohibited. Oh, well, Do you think that this is a bridge? Period. Oh, Mr. Graziano, just a moment. Uh, when I said this, I'm not talking about the fact that Geneva set this up as a separate country, but once the demarcation line was set, was it not Ho Chi Minh and the North Vietnamese that closed that border after a million refugees had fled from the communist regime that was imposed in North Vietnam, had fled to South Vietnam? Did they not make this a country themselves? And did they not create or start the aggression with regard to South Vietnam in violation of that treaty? What about, now, let, let's, what about let's hear Senator Kennedy on this, I, I uh, Mr. Graziani. Let, uh, let's hear Senator Kennedy on this. Uh, well, first, uh, I, I think probably I have some differences with uh, Governor Reagan regarding uh, uh, communism at the moment. Uh, uh, first, uh, I'd say... My question first. Well, I don't know. I'm sorry. Is that necessary? You should. You I'll should give me the legal right <laughs> for America to be in Vietnam. I'll come around to it. I think I can answer it the way no, I No, I think you should. Hold on. <laughs> uh, I don't think that uh, communism is a uh, monolithic uh, political system at the moment. I think there are very major differences between the Soviet Union and communist China. And I think that that's recognized in the United States as I think it's recognized in Europe and recognized elsewhere around the globe. I uh, agree that I don't think that the uh, communist system wishes us well, but I think that it's recognized that, uh, that it's a different system than it was uh, 20 years ago, that we're going to make every effort within the United States our governments, uh, our people, make every effort to try to reach an accommodation, particularly with the Soviet Union, that we recognize the uh, danger from uh, China, but that, uh, pr as President Johnson has said, that we're going to make every effort to try to reach an accommodation also with uh, communist China, if that's possible, perhaps out of the internal struggles that are taking place within China at the present time. Out of that might come a government uh, which, uh, with which not only the United States, but the Soviet Union and other countries around the globe uh, could deal. That's what we are hoping. Let's, uh, I will let's see what I'll be glad to the answer the question. Um, but you did not answer the question. No, I will be glad to answer the question. I'll be glad yes, to answer the Well, I, I asked you already, what are the legal rights for I, I know, America but, to be in Vietnam? Yeah, I'm going to uh, answer that. Uh, I just say that the other Tell people... Tell me just that... Yeah, I, I say other people have raised points, and I think that uh, it's interesting well, that they've raised the them and that we're going to do discuss them. But in any case, uh, we were invited to come in in uh, 1955 uh, by the government at that time to give help and assistance. Uh, it was after, uh, in 19, during 1959 and 1960, 1961, 1962, when there were indications that North Vietnam was supporting some insurgency within the South, and it was to struggle against that insurgency that the United States uh, sent uh, greater numbers of people. Uh, we have had the same agreements in uh, Western Europe. Uh, the, uh, we sent uh, troops to uh, Western Europe and kept them there with NATO after uh, the end of the Second World War to uh, ensure that there wouldn't be an overthrowing uh, of the uh, governments of those countries and that the people themselves could um, determine and, um, their own destiny and their own future. The town meeting of the world will be back in a moment. There she goes, she's a seagull girl With a livelier, happier, younger point of view Seagull diet food works. It helps keep you slender. It's a complete 225-calorie meal for your diet plan. 
rich in protein, extra big servings, many, many tasty flavors. Seago is the good tasting one that helps keep you slender, and it works. Why don't you be a Seago girl? And enjoy the joy of a new slender Seago you. Seago has just made some special, very flavors that are very rich and very deep. Four special flavors in their own special cans. So very rich, very deep, that you might not like them if you're not a very person. But I bet you are. Town Meeting of the World will continue after this pause for station identification. Well, we were having a brisk argument about whether or not the National Liberation Front should be represented. And among the students, there are all sorts of hands up. Uh, Stephen Marks. Well, first of all, I'd like to ask Governor Reagan uh, how he thinks of his attitude towards legitimacy and uh, the principle of negotiation with rebels had been applied in the 18th century. I'd like to know how he thinks his country would ever have achieved independence. I think we have to be pretty realistic about these supposed wars of liberation. The legitimate uprising of a people who uh, rose, as did the Americans a couple of hundred years ago, against what they considered a, a tyranny and invasion of rights, uh, beginning with the line in the Declaration, when in the course of human events. Uh, we must be realistic enough today to ask ourselves, are these truly wars of liberation and the uprising uh, of a people? Or are these being instigated by someone outside as a part of the great ideological conflict which still seems to be going on in the world today? Now, uh, this is what I, if the Viet Cong and the South Vietnamese uh, sit down and negotiate out whatever differences have caused the Viet Cong to rebel, uh, I think we might be surprised to discover that the Viet Cong, uh, I wouldn't be surprised, is a very uh, tiny minority uh, instigated by an outside force, namely North Vietnam. But it hardly constitutes an uprising of the people of South Vietnam. I think that it's important that the United States associate itself with, with those forces within a country who are in favor not just of change, for change's sake, but, uh, but uh, for a better life for the uh, people of these uh, nations. Uh, not uh, with the uh, prince in his palace or the general in his barracks, but with the uh, peasant in the field and with the student and uh, with those who uh, want to lead a better life and lead their country in a better life. Not to turn over one tyranny, uh, however, for uh, another tyranny. Uh, not for one kind of dictatorship uh, to uh, the, another kind of dictatorship. Would you like to see the United States dissociating itself from the military regime which is now in Greece? Greece. But I think it's unfortunate whenever a, um, a, the military takes over from a democratic system in a country. I think it's particularly unfortunate when it takes place in Europe, where the other countries look to for, other countries of the world look to for some kind of guidance. And I think particularly because democracy began in Greece, began in Athens, uh, that it's uh, particularly unfortunate that it should happen there. Uh, I think the United States must make it clear that we, uh, that our relationship with Greece is going to continue to be strained unless the uh, country return to uh, democratic processes. And I, for one, would be in opposed to giving any military aid or assistance to Greece until it's made quite clear that the people themselves are going to determine their future, not uh, a military hunter. Do you agree with that, Governor Reagan? Well, this is a pretty cloudy situation over there, and I'm not sure that I um, agree completely that... Um, well, I'm not sure that the forces that the military junta rose up to put down were completely dedicated to Greece's welfare, or whether they perhaps were again a part of this 
instigation of uprising and violence on the part of people who have a prior allegiance to uh, an economic and political theory uh, that they believe should dominate the world. We think that uh, communists will be all over the world because it is the real, uh, very good system. You believe that uh, another system would be all over the world. But we shouldn't uh, uh, quarrel, we shouldn't uh, fight against each other. And uh, instead of saying such things as you said, we would like to negotiate and we would like to have it in, uh, in Vietnam nowadays. And we would like to negotiate now in Vietnam and not, uh, not to see American troops in Vietnam now. And we know that over uh, 50,000 uh, people, American soldiers, are going to Vietnam. And we would think that uh, it will create a new world war because uh, a Chinese Prime Minister said that if Americans landed in North Vietnam, they would like to send their volunteers there. And you know that the Soviet Union in the open said about that, they would like to send our volunteers too. And so it might create a new dangerous world war. And I think instead of sending American troops to Vietnam, it's better to negotiate and to stop this war in Vietnam and to negotiate between the Soviet Union in America and to create a very good atmosphere. Uh, this discussion is now sounding like many I've had at Oxford, many I've had uh, in Europe. It's one in which uh, discussions of Vietnam somehow degenerate into uh, polemical accusations and uh, disputations of facts, etc., etc. Uh, I think there's a basic understanding that must be had in any kind of discussion here, and that is uh, that the United States is, is not out to achieve a, a position of power uh, in land or economic force in the world. And I think that there are other things that we should uh, d debate here. Uh, when you talk about negotiations, which seem to be the main uh, advocation of everyone here, uh, well, what, so we have negotiations, and we bring the people from the uh, NLF, and we bring the people from North Vietnam, and we bring the people from South Vietnam and the United States. Well, then what do we negotiate for? Do we negotiate for a, a stable Asia? And what does a stable Asia mean? Does this mean the United States should be present in Asia? Or does it mean the United States should be absent and let revolutionary forces take their course? Uh, I think these are more, more important questions that, that could be asked. And I'm sure, uh, uh, for example, Mr. Singh from uh, India, if we uh, ask him if uh, the Chinese happen to uh, attack India, to whom would he first go for uh, help? Would he go to the Soviet Union or would he go to the United States? Uh, I th think that there are certain considerations here about stability in Asia that haven't been answered. Well, um, let's, let, let's see. Uh, I called on Mr. Delvac of France before. Uh, Bill has mentioned recently the uh, necessity of the presence of the eventuality of the presence of the United States in Asia. I think the best presence of any country in any other country is a diplomatic presence. And President Johnson has mentioned the necessity of, a, say, normalizing the relationship between the United States and China. Governor Reagan, do you think this uh, normalization is desirable? Well, the only objection that I've had with some of the building bridges that has been attempted by this country is very frankly, we haven't been hard-nosed enough in uh, in getting, uh, now when I say concession, I don't mean that they have to buy their way, but in getting concessions that would also help build the bridge from the other end. For example, uh, I think uh, when we signed the consular treaty uh, with the Soviet Union, I think there were things that we could have asked in return. I think it would be very admirable if the Berlin Wall, which was built in direct contravention to a treaty, if the Berlin Wall should disappear. Uh, I think this would be a step toward peace and toward self-determination for all people, if it were. And so, uh, I think what you're bringing up here, and this ties in with something that Bill Bradley said, and is very significant. Among people of goodwill in the world today, there's too much of a tendency to argue challenging or suspecting the other fellow's motive, when perhaps what we're challenging is only the method that has been suggested. Uh, Let's start with the premise that all people want peace and uh, not suspect that anything that someone else suggests is a plot 
For example, we don't want the Berlin Wall knocked down so it's easier to get at the throats of the East Germans. We just think that a wall that is put up to confine people and keep them within their own country instead of allowing them the freedom of world travel uh, has to be somehow wrong. I don't think you're uh, really answering my question. I, I asked you whether you considered the, that the normalization of the relationship between the United States and China was desirable. Well, well, I thought I had. I guess maybe I was too general in that. When you say the normalization, uh, what do you mean? You mean that well, the United exactly States should... Well, you to tell me. Well, all right. Uh, the United States, will say, has wheat, and China is undergoing a great famine, and we could help with that wheat. Should we stand over here and give that wheat to the government of the Red Chinese, who incidentally have never proven that they are the choice of the Chinese people, do you think, do you think Chiang Kai-shek is a better wait a minute, choice? Wait a minute. Now, just a minute before uh, my young English friend smiles there aloud. Uh, what if we said, in an effort to bring friendship between the two peoples, that we be allowed to provide this wheat in such a way that we are sure that the Chinese people, those who need it, can get it, uh, at the same time that we ask in return for the Red Chinese, uh, to sit down with an effort toward giving up some of their hostile uh, utterances which uh, openly announce their aggressive intent. Uh, is this wrong? Go Governor Reagan, you are on record as having supported the um, Senator Goldwater when he was running for president. One, one of the things he said was extremism was about extremism and, and liberty. Now, h how do you do you see any essential difference between saying this and, and a Stoke Lake Carmichael saying to hell with the laws of this country and those two sayings as extreme, I mean, as each, and they're both extreme. And when you talk about Red China giving up some of its hostile sayings, would you give up this saying, which is patently hostile? Well, I don't think there was anything hostile in what he said. Actually, I could have questioned whether that was the time and place to say it. He was paraphrasing a very famous remark that goes back, I guess, to Cicero. Uh, and what he was paraphrasing... Indeed. Uh, he was paraphrasing in that statement uh, the idea of um, uh, all-out defense of virtue, uh, all-out defense of liberty, and that there was, a, I would think, that a soldier... Uh, who died in World War II fighting Hitlerism uh, had gone all the way out in his defense of what we believe to be uh, right and moral, virtuous, and uh, certainly in defense of freedom. Now, to turn Excuse this... Excuse me, sir. Could you, could you substitute communism for virtue and you see the, the deadlock which it would produce? You think something is good, he thinks something else is good. You want him to give up some of his hostile views you are not prepared to move back one inch from yours. May Where I ask... Your good All right, wait a minute. Let me ask you one question. I could almost guess the answer, but I know what the answer is in my own heart, and that of people who will really weigh this. At the end of World War II, one nation in the world had unprecedented power, had not suffered any damage to its industrial complex, had the greatest military force the world had ever seen put together, the United States. The rest of the world was war-weary. The United States also had the only bomb that had been demonstrated. We had the atomic bomb, that great weapon. Now, the United States disarmed. The United States made no effort to impose its will on the rest of the nation. Can you honestly say in your heart that had the Soviet Union been in a comparable position with that bomb, or today's Red Chinese in a position with that bomb and with that great military force, that the world would not today have been conquered by that force? Don't, don't this forget that the not. Soviet Union which fought the war is not the Soviet Union which, which is here now. And in any case, there, there is no comparison, really. How can you give an answer to such a purely say, hypothetical question. No, I am saying that I'm saying this as an evidence of the proof. We're talking, uh, we America were supposed to, on this program, no, we were supposed to be talking about the image of America. And I would like to point out how consistent this was with our past, of no aggressive intent at a chance when for the first time, perhaps in all of world's history, there was a nation with the power to have done it. 
You know, perhaps one day history might record that we goofed, that that was the time when the United States should have said to everyone, lay down your arms and then we'll lay down ours. Huh? Albert, we have, a, we have a representative of the Soviet Union here, Vladimir. Uh, it what seems about to that? me that it is uh, very strange uh, to hear from you that uh, America, the only country who used uh, to have an atomic bomb and uh, didn't use it uh, against another country. It seems to me that uh, it isn't a very good idea to say so. We now have a lot of armaments. We now have a lot of people. But we are not uh, going to use this armament, these people, against America or um, against uh, in other countries. And it seems to me that uh, America, who did take part in the last war, uh, and the Soviet Union did take part in the last war. And if we say, for example, about the America who uh, gave a lot to uh, finish the war with uh, uh, Hitler, with uh, Germany, we can speak about that uh, from, the, from uh, the Soviet point of view. But we don't uh, boast about that. It isn't necessary to do that, I think so. We'll get back to this in a moment as we continue with Town Meeting of the World. Now, zesty blue cheese. Garlic, too. Just a whisper in the first blue cheese salad dressing with an Italian accent. New Italian blue from Seven Seas. The bold blue. Creamy. So that bold new flavor clings. Unsinkable. Won't sink to the bottom of the bowl. Taste zesty blue cheese. Italian style. New Italian blue cheese dressing. Another delicious dressing from Seven Seas. Remember when the best tasting spread came from a tub? Well, it still does. Chiffon. The soft margarine with a delicious melting flavor of the expensive spread. That's because chiffon is made soft with light, delicate safflower oil. And safflower oil makes chiffon highest in polyunsaturates lowest in saturated fat of all margarines. Chiffon, best taste that ever came out of a tub. Now, uh, the lovely blonde girl from England. Uh, I'd like to change the subject to civil rights. In England, there is a growing movement for legislation against racial discrimination. I believe that many states have experience of this legislation. Would both candidates like to comment on this and perhaps other countries may learn from America's experience? Uh, Senator Kennedy, you were Attorney General when the civil rights uh, legislation was in a crucial phase. Well, I'm not familiar with the exact kind of legislation that's being proposed uh, within uh, uh, your own country. Uh, we passed uh, some major bills in 1964, 1965, 1966, which gave some guarantees to individuals in the field of education, in the field of using public accommodations such as hotels and restaurants, and in the field of job discrimination. Uh, some of the legislation has been more effective than other parts of it, but there was an effort by the United States to try to deal with the problem, not completely successfully, but at least we made, started to make the effort. If you want to talk about some particular piece of legislation, I think it was extremely important that we pass the legislation. I think it was extremely important that we have recognized the problem and began to deal with it, but I would say to you, quite frankly, we've by no means made uh, this very difficult problem that affects the United States disappear. And we're going to have a lot of problems, including uh, uh, some of the disorders that have happened in the past over the period of the last six years. We're going to continue to have those within our own country for some years to come. We're dealing with a heritage of 150 years. We've been unjust to the, uh, our minority groups, and particularly the Negroes but as well as some other groups, the Mexican-Americans, the Indians. And uh, we've just begun to recognize it, and now we're starting to deal with it. And uh, I think we're going to have to continue to deal with it in the form of legislative action, as well as uh, personal activity on the part of all of us. Governor Reagan, uh, what do you think, uh, as a governor of a great state, of the effectiveness of American civil rights le legislation? Well, I think with all of the disorders, we've lost sight of some of the progress that has been made. There can be no question but that in this country, uh, well, I guess in all the world, there is the heritage of uh, those people who mistrust those who are different. And when you have, and history tells us, when you've had a people enslaved, uh, you have a much harder time. It is not just a racial or ethnic or religious difference. Uh, there is a, a prejudice that remains. Now, 
I happen to believe that the greatest part of the problem lies in the hearts of men. I think that bigotry and prejudice is probably the worst of all man's ills, the hardest uh, to correct. And in addition to legislation which guarantees and enforces our Constitution, and our Constitution, and it differs from the constitutions of many of the countries represented there by the young people. Many constitutions promise their people the same things that ours does. But there's one subtle and yet very great difference. Those constitutions in many other countries say the government grants to the people these rights. And our Constitution says you are born with these rights just by virtue of being a human being and no government can take them from you. Now, we found it necessary to legislate to make it more possible for government to exert its responsibility to guarantee those constitutional rights. At the same time, we have much more that can be done in the area of just uh, human relationship. I happened to bridge a time span in which uh, I was a, a radio sports announcer for Major League Sports in our country in athletics many years ago. At that time, the great American game of baseball uh, had a rule book whose opening line was, baseball is a game for Caucasian gentlemen. And up until that time, up until World War II, there had never been a, a Negro play in organized major league or minor league baseball in America. And one man defied that rule, a man named Brent Rickey of one of the major league teams. And today, baseball is far better off, and our country is far better off because he destroyed that by hand-picking one man and putting him on his baseball team. And the rule disappeared. Now, I don't say this is the only answer, but we must use both. And I think that people in positions like ourselves, like the Senator and myself, like the President of the United States, can do a great deal of good, perhaps uh, almost as much as proper legislation, if we take the lead in saying uh, those who operate their businesses or their lives on a basis of practicing discrimination and prejudice uh, are practicing what is an evil sickness, and that we would not knowingly patronize a business that did such a thing, and we urge all right-thinking people to join us and not patronize that business, soon we will make those who live by prejudice learn that they stand alone, that they're Andrew, away. Our, uh, uh, excuse me, Governor. Andrew no. Lazar, a Swiss student, yes. hasn't been you know, in on this After all this discussion. rather irrelevant rhetoric, to my mind, how does um, Mr. Regan explain the fact that there is a very much higher percentage of Negro soldiers in the Vietnamese, in the American forces in Vietnam, then there is a percentage of Negroes in the States. Is it perhaps due to the fact that Negroes have more difficulty still and will continue to have more difficulty in finding jobs in America? I don't think anyone could deny that because of this heritage of prejudice, which the Senator referred to, uh, there has been and among our minority groups, a greater percentage who did not go on uh, through our educational system, did not qualify themselves for the better jobs, and so therefore, there perhaps is a higher percentage who find the army uh, or the military uh, a suitable job and a good job uh, in the face of lack of opportunity in other lines. And uh, Kennedy, this could be about, true. Uh, that question. Senator Kennedy, what about your view? I on think that his budget? point is well taken. The, uh, gentlemen, I think, from Switzerland. There are a higher degree, a higher rate of Negroes serving in uh, uh, Vietnam than the population as a whole, and the casualties in, in Vietnam uh, amongst Negroes is higher than the population as a whole. Um, I think that's uh, partially due to what he mentioned. Secondly, I think it's also the fact that the draft has been unfair here in this country and has discriminated against uh, those who were poor and those in the lower economic groups, which we're trying to remedy now. But uh, this, these are some of the problems, and we've recognized it, and we're trying to de do something about it. Some legislation was passed in the United States Senate just this past week, which will at least partially rec uh, rectify the situation. But uh, the Negroes uh, and the lower economic groups, a larger percentage of them as a population as a whole, have uh, been drafted, taken into the Army, and have been serving in Vietnam, and have suffered casualties. And I think uh, that uh, I think it's most unfortunate. Senator, Governor Reagan, gentlemen and ladies of our university group, I'm afraid that our time has run out. 
I know you didn't get a lot of questions in that you would have liked to have done, and I suspect that the governor and the senator didn't get some answers in that they would have liked. But thank you very much for being with us on this town meeting of the world. Can we just say a word? Mr. Charles to... Galling, yes, say a word. Well, just uh, how much we've enjoyed, and I'm sure Governor Reagan has, and uh, obviously we don't agree on all of these matters, but it's so extremely important within our own country that we have a dialogue. We make major mistakes within the United States. So we recognize that. Perhaps we don't remedy them as rapidly as you would like to see us remedy or deal with them. But there are people, even though uh, Governor Reagan and I represent different political parties and perhaps a different point of view on some of these matters, we recognize the fact that we are obviously far from perfect. But the world is so close together now uh, because of uh, technology, because of uh, a lot of different things, that it's so important that we have these kind of exchanges. And particularly as the world belongs to you, that uh, what we do and the decisions that we make have an effect on your lot, that you continue where you see that we make mistakes, that you continue to criticize, but that, as I said earlier, that you examine the facts, and that all of us, whether we're here in the United States or elsewhere, examine the facts and try to deal with them. Plato once said that all things are to be questioned, and all things are to be examined and brought into question. There's no limit uh, set to thought. And I think that has to apply for all of us, particularly those who have the advantage of an education. Thank you. Mr. Collingwood, is there time for just a word of farewell? Governor, I'm I'll let you second that. Well, I do second it. The very fact that we have uh, discussion and differences, uh, I think, brings me to the point, being the oldest one here, I can take the liberty of giving a little advice to the young people. I believe the highest aspiration of man should be individual freedom and the development of the of the individual, that there is a sacredness to individual rights. And I would like to say to all of the young people as they pursue their way, and this has been very stimulating, I think you should weigh everything that is proposed to you, everything in the line of government and law and economic theory, everything of that kind, and weigh it on this one scale, that it should at all times not offer you some kind of sanctuary or security in exchange for your right to fly as high and as far as your own strength and ability will take you as an individual with no ceiling put on that effort. Plenty of room for a floor underneath so that no one in this world should live in degradation beneath that floor. But you reserve the right for yourself to be free. Thank you very much again. This is Town Meeting of the World. This is Charles Collingwood. Good night. Hi. Just a manicure, not my hair. Headaches back. I need more pills. Try Vanquish. Vanquish? Helps you have the short headache. Huh? It goes away and doesn't come back. It's made to bring more relief action than the usual round pills. Oh? And has something that acts on an important factor in most headache pain. Pressure on vascular nerves. Ready? Ready for anything. With Vanquish, your headache shouldn't come back. That's the short headache. What gives Carrington the taste worth fighting for? Worth fighting for. The bright inviting taste worth fighting for. Worth fighting for. Carrington's got a charcoal tip and it's got a white one too. Together they improve that great tobacco taste for you. Us Carrington smokers would rather fight than switch. Join the unswitchable smoke Carrington. This has been another in the CBS News series, Town Meeting of the World. Tonight's subject was the image of America and the youth of the world.